Hello and welcome to your respiratory and digestive system screencast, which will cover laboratories two and three. So we'll start off with our respiratory system and all the images in the screencast have either been taken from Seeley's Anatomy and Physiology, um, Anatomy and Physiology Revealed, University of Michigan's Blue Link, and the Netter Atlas. So we'll start off with the larynx, and this is an anterior view that we have here. If you take your hand and slide it right below your chin, straight back until you hit your neck area, that is where you are going to feel your hyoid bone, which is this horseshoe shaped bone right here. Now this bone is the only bone that is, well I shouldn't say only bone, but it is one of the only bones that is not connected to another bone, meaning there's no articulations with any other bones. And so this is freely floating um, with attachments to 22 different muscles and ligaments. Now the only thing that we see attached to it here is a membrane called your thyrohyoid membrane. And it's called this because it attaches to what we see in purple here, your thyroid cartilage. And so your thyroid cartilage has a ton of different um, uh, landmarks on it, but the only one you need to know is this one right here that sticks out just a bit more anteriorly, and that is called your laryngeal prominence, and this is also known as your Adam's apple. Now your thyroid cartilage, you will soon see in a posterior view, is open posteriorly. The cartilage below your thyroid cartilage is called your cricoid cartilage. And this cartilage is closed posteriorly. So this is a full ring around, um, around this structure, around the larynx. And attaching between your thyroid and your cricoid cartilage is your cricothyroid ligament. Now let's go ahead and take a look at some other structures here. We only see this little portion of the epiglottis. It sits posterior to your hyoid bone and your thyroid cartilage. So we'll see a little bit better view posteriorly. And your vestibular folds and ventricular folds we do not see in this view. So we will take a look at that shortly as well. First, let's look at a posterior view of the larynx. So now what we're looking at is that open posterior view of the thyroid cartilage. And then inferiorly, we have the cricoid cartilage. Now you may recognize that this cricoid cartilage looks a lot larger posteriorly. And that is true. It is a lot uh, thicker posteriorly than it is anteriorly. So let's switch back to that anterior view real quick. Look how narrow it is. So I always think of the cricoid cartilage as a class ring. That class ring posteriorly is pretty large, but when you look at it in the palm aspect, your anterior aspect, it is very narrow. So beyond there, we can see our full epiglottis at this point. And this is a leaf like piece of elastic cartilage. And what our epiglottis cartilage does is it swings inferiorly to cover up our uh, larynx when we intake food or fluid. So this is a nice sagittal view of our larynx. And you can see where I put this blue line over here is our epiglottis. So this is going to move inferiorly Obviously here we have our oral cavity with the teeth and you see your tongue. So when we intake fluid and liquid that enters our oral cavity and moves into our oropharynx back over here. And hopefully what, we're, what we want to happen is this epiglottis will move inferiorly so that food and water will move posteriorly into, I should say posteriorly and inferiorly into your esophagus. Now here is your larynx, 
you may have also already recognized that here is your thyroid cartilage. Now we don't really have a posterior portion to your thyroid cartilage, so that's not back in here. But what we can see is the anterior portion of your cricoid cartilage here and posterior portion of your cricoid cartilage. Now you may be wondering what these little slits are in here, and that is going to be your vocal folds. So let's look at that just um, in a minute. So let's finish pointing out that this is your larynx over here. Below that, that air would then move down into your trachea, and of course we've already pointed out the esophagus posteriorly. So here are your vestibular folds, or also known as your false vocal cords. They are called your false vocal cords because they do not assist in vocalization. And then your true vocal cords are inferior to that. They are also called your ventricular folds. And the way I remember this is that there is a TR in here in ventricular for true. And to remember which one is superior and which one is inferior, I remember that F comes before the letter T. So this is a superior view. So if you were to take a camera and put it down your throat and looked just superior to the larynx, you would see that this over here would be your epiglottis. And then these are some retinoid and uh, corniculate cartilages that we did not discuss. I'm just going to take you back to this image real quick just so you get an idea of what we're looking at. So imagine you're looking down on this area. You would see your epiglottis. And the retinoid and corniculate cartilage are these two structures here on each side. So let's go back to that image, that superior view. And of course, we don't really see cartilage type of tissue here because this is all covered with mucosa. So now if we look inferior to that, what you will see is your vestibular folds. And notice how these are a bit more lateral than the more inferior true vocal cords or ventricular folds. Now these true cords are for vocalization. Your false vocal cords, even though they don't help with vocalization, they help to create intrathoracic or intra-abdominal pressure. So I wanted to show you some cadaveric pictures as to what this would look like in lab. So this is a bit of a lateral view. So you could see that larger thyroid cartilage and then lying over your cricoid cartilage you could see a piece of it down over here, we have this special muscle called the cri cricothyroid muscle. And this muscle, what it does is it helps to tilt and pull the prominence or the angle of our thyroid cartilage anteriorly and inferiorly. So that what that does is it increases the distance between that laryngeal prominence or thyroid prominence and the retinoid cartilage, the cartilages that I briefly mentioned. And this takes the anterior ends of our vocal ligaments attached to the posterior aspect of the prominence and elongates and tightens them. So it will help in doing that, it'll help to raise the pitch of our voice. So I always would love to see what Mariah Carey's laryngeal prominence, how anterior and inferior it moves compared to a normal person um, to get those high pitches when singing. So this is another lateral view of the larynx and you could see over here is our thyroid cartilage, laryngeal prominence would be over here. And then um, right over here we see part of that cricothyroid ligament. This is a right in the center, so we would say this is the median portion. And here is our cricoid cartilage, and that cricothyroid muscle has been dissected away here. Now this is a really interesting dissection. Um, in order to see this view, they have disarticulated the skull and cut away the pharynx so that you can Basically, we're looking at an internal view of the larynx. So over here would be your uh, epiglottis. And we could do this dissection on one of the free cadavers that we have at Rush as well. Um, so here's your epiglottis. And I wanted you to be familiar with what these spaces are called. So above, 
first let's point out our vocal cords before we go into the spaces. So right over here would be my false or vestibular fold, and then inferiorly would be my, I should point it out on the sides here, my true vocal cords or my ventricular folds. And so the space above my false vocal cords here, this would be called my vestibule, pharyngeal vestibule. And then the space between the actual false vocal fold, that space is called the rima vestibuli. The space sitting inferior to the false vocal fold, but superior to my true vocal fold, that is called the ventricle. The space that sits between the two sides of my true vocal fold, that space is called rima glottidis. And the last space inferior to the true vocal fold, this is called the infraglottic cavity. Now you might have to go through that a couple of times. I do have a video where I use former nursing students to basically act out um, these folds and where the spaces lie. So I will put that link on Blackboard for you. Just take a minute, pause the screencast, and go and watch that video. It's just a minute long, and then come back to the screencast. Okay, so now let's move into the trachea and the bronchial tree. So superiorly, we see our larynx. That is going to take us down to the trachea. Your trachea is about 15 centimeters long, and it's made up of these C-shaped hyaline cartilage um, portions. You can't see the C-shape in this view, but posteriorly, the trachea is... Um, we would say there's no cartilage posteriorly. Rather, we have a muscle called tracheolus muscle, and then posterior to the trachea, of course, we have the esophagus. So when we get to the most inferior portion of the trachea, you will see this almost V-shaped piece of cartilage, and this is called the carina. The carina is really important because in this area, we have nervous tissue that would trigger a cough reflex if there was something to move down the trachea and stimulate these sensory nerves in here. So hopefully at that point we could cough and cause the foreign object to move back up and out of our oral cavity. So past the carina we see that there's a bifurcation into your right primary or main bronchus and your left main or primary bronchus. Bronchus is always singular, bronchi is plural. And so each primary bronchus will enter its respective lung, meaning the right primary bronchus enters the right lung and the left primary bronchus enters the left lung. At that point, it will then bifurcate further. So we will soon learn that the right lung will have three lobes and the left lung will only have two lobes. So in your right lung, your primary bronchus will branch into three secondary bronchi to go to each respective lobe. And this is why they're also called lobar bronchi. After that, they will further bifurcate into tertiary bronchi, and each of these bronchi will go and supply each bronchopulmonary segment, which in our lecture portion of chapter 23, we will discuss what those bronchopulmonary segments are. For now, just know that they are certain areas within the lobe that are sectioned off to certain tertiary bronchi. Um, and so this is why they're also called segmental bronchi. You can also see um, in this image to the, your right here, the primary bronchi and how it branches into the secondary bronchi and some examples of the tertiary bronchi. So I wanted to give you a little bit more information about each of these bronchi. The right and left bronchi are actually just a bit different from one another. They're like kind of like brother and sister. So the um, right primary bronchus is going to be much shorter compared to that of the left. It is 2.5 centimeters long and it's also going to be wider in diameter and more in line with the trachea. So it forms a less acute angle with the trachea itself. 
our left primary bronchus is twice as long. It's five centimeters long and more narrow in diameter and it's less in line with the trachea. So it forms more of an acute angle with the trachea. And so if we were to have a foreign object come in through the trachea, let's say that carina was not good at triggering that cough reflex, which side do you feel like that foreign object would move into? most likely it would move into the right side because it is more in line with the trachea and has that wider opening. Hopefully it doesn't get to that point. Okay, so here are some cadaveric images of those structures. Here is our trachea continuing on down. Here's our right primary bronchus and our left primary bronchus. And I just wanted to show you those C-shaped uh, hyaline cartilages of the trachea. So you could see the C-shape right back in here. And this would be our tracheolus muscle connecting the two sides together. So next let's get into our lungs. Here is a beautiful right lung and a beautiful left lung. Let's learn all the different structures on them. First, both lungs are going to have this pointed, rounded superior end, and that is called the apex. And at the inferior end, we have more of the broad portion that would make contact with the diaphragm, and that is called the base. So here's a medial view of the lung. So think of the medial view as facing in toward the heart. So here we have a, a location, I always like to call it, um, termed the hilus or the hilum. And in this hilus, we will find the root of the lung. All of these structures are either entering or leaving the lung at the hilus collectively. So what structures will we find in here? pulmonary artery is one. Um, this, if you remember from our heart lecture, will be the uh, a branch off of your pulmonary trunk that is bringing deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lung. We will also have two pulmonary veins that'll carry the oxygenated blood it just received from the lung back to the heart at the left atrium. And then we have our primary bronchus that has branched from the trachea and will allow air to move into our lung. So here is a cadaveric image of what the hyla of the lungs, hyla is plural, hyla of the lungs looks like. So look for more of this dotted um, dashed line, I should say, going around the hylus. So the hylus is just a location. The root of the lung is the contents of the pulmonary artery, pulmonary veins, and um, bronchus. So let's look at each of these. You'll see that the pulmonary artery, bronchi, and veins will be situated a little bit different depending on if you're looking at a right lung or a left lung. So you could see that the pulmonary artery or at the hilus, usually we will see um, you know, two branching pulmonary arteries. So here's one superiorly and one more in the um, middle portion of the hilus. And then the bronchi at this point, you may also see that the primary bronchus is splitting into become the secondary bronchi. bronchi. So you could see one heading over to a superior lobe here, um, one headed down to your inferior lobe, and I'm sure that there's one branching over to your middle lobe at this point. And then inferiorly, we are gonna find your pulmonary veins. Here's a view of your left lung. Superiorly, we find the pulmonary artery, and then in the um, intermediate area or middle portion of the hilus, we would find your bronchus, and then most inferiorly, we would find the pulmonary veins. So here is a um, view of your right lung. We have three lobes here. So you have a superior or upper lobe. We have a middle lobe and an inferior lobe, or also known as your lower lobe. Some other structures that we have here, separating your superior lobe from your middle lobe would be your horizontal fissure, and separating your superior and middle lobes from your inferior lobe would be your oblique fissure. We also can see in the teal, it's kind of blending in here, but we would see these impressions on the lungs. So this one would be your groove for the azygous vein, 
and in pink we see the groove for the esophagus. Here is our left lung where we only have two lobes. So this would be our superior lobe or upper lobe, and this would be our inferior or lower lobe. And these two lobes are separated by an oblique fissure. Remember, oblique means diagonal. And we have a couple interesting structures here. So first I'll point out this teal colored one down in here. This is called your lingula, lingula meaning tongue. And um, this is found on the inferior aspect of your superior lobe. And um, anatomists speculate that this was remnant of a middle lobe that was found on your left lung. Now, sometimes you might be wondering, you know, why is it that your right lung would have three and your left lung would only have two lobes? And the reason is that the left lung just had to make room for your heart. And so your right lung is responsible for 66% of the oxygen exchange that takes place within your bodies because it's a little bit longer, uh, larger, excuse me. Um, and so that brings me to these pink arrows that you see here. This is gonna be your cardiac impression or cardiac notch of where the heart would sit nice and close to that left lung. And then we have this other impression here in red, which would be the impression from your aorta. So these are just some cadaveric views of your um, of the different lungs, of the different lobes on your lungs. Um, so you could see on the left of your screen would be a right lung, and here is your superior lobe, a middle lobe, and inferior lobe. So let's think, what is this dashed line over here? That would be your oblique fissure. And this dashed line over here, that would be your horizontal fissure. Good. So then if we look at your left lung here, this would of course be your superior lobe, your inferior lobe over here, and this dashed line would be your oblique fissure. So this is just a image um, illustrating the fissures and then of course the apex of the lungs. So now we're going to move into some nerves that we're going to find um, around your lungs. First we have your phrenic nerve and this comes from the ventral rami of C3, C4, and C5. So you can see those branches coming off over here and they merge together and descend down the neck and into the thorax. And what they're gonna do is course anterior to the root of the lung and continue down to give innervation to the diaphragm. So this is a cadaveric image of how that nerve is going to course. You see it moving down the thorax, anterior to that root of the lung, and of course, continuing down to the diaphragm. So this is just another view. Let's first look at the phrenic nerve continuing down anterior to that root of the lung. This would be our root of the lung over here. And the other nerve that I want to introduce you to is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the name for cranial nerve number 10, or we would abbreviate it as CNX for the Roman numeral. Uh, meaning 10, and this we will find posterior to the root of the lung, so continuing on down that way. Off of our vagus nerve, we have another important nerve known as your left recurrent laryngeal nerve, and this is going to innervate structures of the larynx, specifically the vocal cords, and you will see this extend off of your vagus nerve, and then it swings around um, here's your ligamentum arteriosum. So it swings from behind that and then over the uh, aorta and then rejoins the, the vagus nerve. So this is just another view of that vagus nerve continuing on down. And then you can see right inferior to your aortic arch gives off a branch of that left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now this is a special path that it takes. Um, we of course have a, recur a right recurrent laryngeal nerve 
uh, that is not pictured here, but you can of course see your right vagus nerve over here and we will talk about the course of that right one um, in our lecture portion. We unfortunately, I don't think we'll find the, um, the right recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, in the cadaver lab. So next we'll discuss the muscles of respiration. So you could see that these muscles are found in between the ribs. So we call these your intercostal muscles. Now these muscles that are found more in the lateral aspect of your rib cage and have fibers that move um, inferior medially, these are your external intercostal muscles. And these are used during inspiration. So you kind of want to think the opposite action of what you would expect. External causes inspiration, whereas your internal intercostal muscles are gonna be used during expiration. And the way you're gonna be able to tell the difference is partly placement. Um, your internal intercostals will find better examples of them and more in the medial portion of your rib cage. Um, but we will still find fibers laterally, of course, and you'll just see that their fibers are going to course more, a little bit more vertically or in an opposite fashion compared to that of the external intercostals. These are just some cadaveric images taken from APR of your external intercostal muscles, and here is a view of your internal intercostal muscles. And here are some other ones taken from Blue Link. These are great examples of your external intercostal muscles here pointed out in green. And you could see the opposite um, direction of fibers for your internal intercostal muscles over here in the red. So next let's take a look at your diaphragm. Um, you could see it's that dome-shaped purple muscle here lying inferior to your lungs and heart. And so your phrenic nerve that we just learned about that continues on down to innervate the diaphragm um, is going to come from cervical nerve C3, 4, and 5. And so your diaphragm will change its shape based on if you are in inhaling or exhaling. If you are going to inhale or um, cause inspiration, then the muscle is going to contract. So imagine all those fibers move into one another and this muscle will flatten. And by doing that, it's pulling it down and that brings air into our thoracic cavity. Whereas if we are exhaling or going through expiration, your diaphragm is going to relax all those muscle fibers and elongate and that causes it to have this dome shape so it pushes against your lungs and that causes the air to move out of your um, mouth or nose so the way that we can remember all this information regarding innervation to the diaphragm is a little jingle I used to skip rope to when I was a little girl, and that is C3, 4, and 5 keep the diaphragm alive. And of course, you just have to remember that C3, 4, and 5 turn in, turns into your phrenic nerve. So next, let's take a look at one more muscle, and that is your transversus thoracicus muscle. And if you look at the internal surface of the rib cage over here, so right here would be your sternum, these are your clavicles over here, and of course these would be your ribs moving out laterally, you are going to see these fibers that are extending out are your transverse thoracicus muscles. So now let's move into the digestive system. So we'll start off with the esophagus, and I'm just going through the structures that you will see in the cadaver lab, of course. We know that we would put food first into your oral cavity that would move back into your oropharynx and then into your laryngopharynx, which brings it down into your esophagus at this point. So we move that posteriorly to the heart pierce the diaphragm and at that point where we have the opening for the esophagus that is called your esophageal hiatus and that brings it down into your abdominal cavity. So this is a cadaveric view of what your esophagus would look like. 
So you could see our trachea over here. It has been moved a little bit laterally in order for us to see the full extent of your esophagus. And you could really see the striated muscle when you're in lab of this. So if you first were to dissect uh, your abdominal cavity, you would see this large sack um, of fat. And you'd be wondering, where are all the intestines? Um, so I just wanted to bring your attention to all of this in here. This is called your greater omentum. And it attaches to what we'll soon learn is the greater curvature of the stomach. So. Um, most, this is just another view of your uh, greater omentum. Um, and then of course we have a lesser omentum and that is attaching to the lesser curvature of your stomach over here. So uh, most of the cadaveric pictures beyond this point will not have that omentum in place. So let's continue the pathway of food. We stopped at the esophagus and now we are looking at a view of our stomach. So where the esophagus joins the stomach is called your cardiac opening, um, also known as your lower, or to contain your lower esophageal sphincter. And from this opening, if we were to draw a line across to the lateral side of the stomach, that would um, create this dome shape on top of the stomach. And anytime we see a dome portion on an organ, we call that the fundus. It just looks like so much fun. You just wanna jump on there. And then the main mass of the stomach is called the body. And the inferior portion is known as the pyloric zone. The word pyloric or pylorus refers to gatekeeper. And that is because we have a muscle here called the pyloric sphincter. And when it contracts, it closes off the stomach's entrance of contents into the intestines. And so it is gatekeeping at that point. And of course, when it relaxes, it will allow the contents of the stomach to move into the first part of the, the small intestines. If we look at an internal view of the stomach, we could see that we have these folds called rugae, or we could just call them gastric folds. And sometimes, let me go back to this over here, Sometimes we can have some erosion take place on, in this mucosa of the rugae and get an ulcer um, due to high acidity within the stomach or if we um, have some of the contents of the stomach move into the duodenum and we are not able to neutralize the acidic contents of the stomach that could cause a duodenal ulcer as well. So back to our rugae or gastric folds. Um, this always makes me think of reggae music because when you listen to reggae, you're just like waving your body, your arms around, and that's exactly what these folds look like. They're just wavy lines all around, and this is because we need to increase our surface area within the stomach. So here are some images from APR of these structures. We have your esophagus, the cardiac opening here, the dome-shaped fundus, the main mass or the body of the stomach and the pylorus and at this point from the stomach we are going to move into the first part of the small intestines which is called your duodenum actually before that let's point out the relationship over here to other organs so here is your stomach okay and you'll see in some cadavers this might be much larger and then we have the liver in the left upper quadrant. So we did not discuss the curvatures just yet. On the left portion of the stomach, we have this greater curvature that we said the greater omentum will attach to. And then on the lesser curvature, which would be the right side of the stomach, would be the lesser curvature, which would serve as an attachment for the lesser omentum. This is a nice cut through the pylorus so that you could see that pyloric sphincter um, before we head into the duodenum. And we may have a stomach that is cut open for you to see those gastric folds or rugae. So another um, structure to point out on the small intestines is this 
portion in green here that almost looks like fat when you first look at it. That is your mesentery. And the mesentery is formed by your parietal and visceral peritoneum. And in there we have vessels coursing, um, whether they're arteries, veins, and they could also be lymphatic vessels as well. And we have already looked at these structures uh, within our vasculature lecture um, or structures within the lab. So the, most of the mesentery has been dissected away, but I'm sure we can still find some bodies that have it intact. So you could see here's the vasculature at this point going to the intestines and the mesentery, of course, in this image is not um, depicted. So let's go over the three parts of the small intestines. We have the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. So first we'll discuss the duodenum. It has four different parts. The first part indicated by the number one is called your superior part. And this is going to be the area where duodenal ulcers are most likely to occur because of its proximity to the stomach. So if you have a faulty pyloric sphincter that isn't able to contract and have full closure, we might get a leakage of some of the contents of the stomach or too much of the um, gastric juice is coming into the duodenum that could cause a duodenal ulcer. The, oh, my numbering is off here. So this number one should actually be a two. This is your descending part of the duodenum. And this is going to have an opening here called the major duodenal papilla. Sometimes we even have a minor duodenal papilla here that will allow the bile and pancreatic juices to come into the duodenum to help neutralize the acidic contents in here and also to emulsify fats. And then our horizontal part should be a number three here. So this is the horizontal part. And lastly, we have, this should be a number four for our ascending part that is moving up. So the duodenum is pretty short. And notice how the duodenum is cradling what we will soon know is called the head of the pancreas. So the pancreas is kind of like its little baby that it's, it's cradling. So what does this look like in a cadaver? So here's my stomach over here, and this would be that um, pyloric sphincter that was cut, and here's the first part of the duodenum, or the superior part. We're moving down here, there's our descending part, the horizontal part, and then our ascending part, moving a little bit up. And of course, this would be the head of the pancreas here that the duodenum is cradling. And beyond this ascending part, this would be the jejunum. So the jejunum, the way you will identify this in the cadaver lab is that it would be in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen. I will place a portion of the intestines there, and that is how you will identify it. Now let's take a closer look of, at the duodenum here. In this dissection, they have cut through the duodenal wall, and you can see an opening here. This would be your major duodenal papilla, again, allowing um, bile and pancreatic juices to move into the duodenum. And then sometimes we will have this minor duodenal papilla that will um, allow pancreatic juices into the uh, duodenum as well. So this is just a overall view of the intestines. Again, here is our jejunum in the upper left quadrant or left upper quadrant. Um, and then your ileum is going to travel on down and basically most of it, the way I will test you on this in the cadaver lab, is you should find your ileum in the right lower quadrant because most likely the area I will pin it will be right before it enters the large intestines at the area of the cecum. We can also see some mesentery over here and here's the root of the mesentery. So next we'll talk about the large intestines. You could see the ileum is entering the large intestines over here. We would call this the ileocecal junction and um, allow contents to move into the first part of the large intestines, which is called the cecum. 
So the cecum means a means blind because this is a blind pouch and will continue to move the contents up into the ascending colon. But you may have noticed this little tail that looks like is hanging off of the cecum. This is called your vermiform appendix. Vermiform means worm. So anatomists thought this looks like a little worm hanging off of the cecum, but it is a lymphatic organ because we find some lymphatic tissue within here. It may be missing in some of our cadavers. Um, most likely they had appendicitis and it was removed. So here is an image of our large intestines. You could see the ileum traveling into the cecum here, our nice blind pouch, and you could see quite a nice large appendix hanging off of the cecum here. So the next area we'll explore is the ascending colon. So we move into the ascending colon. So if you trace the right side of your abdomen moving superiorly, this is where your ascending colon would be, then we're going to see that it will bend. And so we're going to call this the hepatic flexure or the right colic flexure. We call it the hepatic flexure because this is going to be found inferior to the liver. And then it will travel over toward the left side of the abdomen. Um, this is a retroperitoneal structure, so you'll find it pretty um, posteriorly. And so the transverse colon will travel over to the left and bend again, so we are going to call this the splenic or the left colic flexure. Splenic because we find it inferior to the spleen. So this is a cadaveric image of those portions of the colon. We left off at the cecum. Here's our ascending colon on the right side of our abdomen. This would be our right colic or hepatic flexure. And then our transverse colon moving across over to the left side. Now at that point, we had that bend, the splenic flexure, and now the large intestines is traveling inferiorly, so we are going to call this the descending colon, and it is found on the left side of our abdomen. It is then going to form a loop, so this is called your sigmoid colon, and I always remember this because the loopiness reminds me of the letter S, so I think sigmoid. And at that point, it goes straight down, and we know the word rectus or rectum means straight, so this is nice and easy to remember. So here's our left colic or splenic flexure, turning into the descending colon. Then we see that nice little loop that it does. This is our sigmoid colon, and down into the rectum it goes. So I wanted to give you some of the features that we expect to find on the large intestines. You might find some fat hanging off of the colon, and these are called epiploic appendages or omental appendages. The function of these are unknown, and you'll see in certain cadavers they will have either a lot of them or it'll look like they have no appendages. Um, so just keep that in mind. Then you'll also see this these small pouches of the colon, and these are called hostra, for plural, hostrum for sing singular. And then you'll see, um, we're going to talk about the different layers of your um, digestive system. Um, and so one of the layers is called muscularis externa. And in there, we would expect to find two layers of smooth muscle. One is a circular layer and one is a longitudinal layer. And so on the large intestines, the longitudinal layer is incomplete. And so instead we get these tenue coli that are formed. Now let's move into some of our accessory organs of our digestive system, starting with the liver. So this is an anterior view, and we have four lobes of our lung. So the right lung, right lobe, excuse me, being the largest. So here's our right lobe, this would be our left lobe. And to see the other lobes, we would have to look at an inferior view of the liver. So this is an inferior view. You can see the right lobe on the right, left lobe on the left. And over here we have this square-shaped lobe. So this is called your quadrate lobe. Quad meaning four-sided. And this is going to be found more anteriorly. So I always think Q and A, quadrate anterior. 
The other one will be this tail-like lobe. So they call this your caudate lobe. Caudate, of course, means tail. And the tail is found posteriorly, so that makes sense. We also have to know two ligaments on your liver. We have your falciform ligament. So you'll find this between the right and left lobe. And it will it basically um, attaches the liver to the anterior abdominal wall. So it's just shooting like through your screen. Imagine your screen is the abdomen, the anterior abdomen. So it's just attaching it there. And within this falciform ligament, if you continue down inferiorly in this region, we will find the round ligament. And the round ligament within its free edge will contain an obliterated umbilical vein. So this used to be your lifeline at one point when you were a fetus. I'm sure you remember those days. So then over here, outlined in teal and the superior aspect of the liver, we have the coronary ligament. Remember, coronary means crown, so this is kind of like the crown on top of the liver. And this is attaching the liver to the diaphragm. We can also see the gallbladder from the inferior aspect of the liver, um, sitting between the right lobe and the quadrate lobe. This gallbladder is going to store and concentrate the bile that the liver makes. So this is a cadaveric view of, it, of the inferior aspect of the liver. We see the right lobe on the right, left lobe on the left, caudate lobe posteriorly, and your quadrate lobe, this is kind of a little bit um, small comp compared to some of the cadaveric ones we'll see in the lab. Um, this is your quadrate lobe, and then this tissue here is your gallbladder. Um, and then so over here we would see the fissure of your round ligament that we just discussed as well. Okay, so just wanted to show you a different view of this falciform ligament. Um, here it is over here. Again, if we had our anterior abdominal wall here, it would attach the liver to that. And then you will see a thickened portion on this free edge that would be your round ligament that contains the obliterated umbilical vein. So if we look um, a bit more inferior to the liver, we could see some structures that belong to an area called the porta hepatis. So We've discussed the blood vessels in this region. You should be familiar with your celiac trunk and your common hepatic artery branching over here. And it becomes your hepatic artery proper and then turns into your right hepatic artery and left hepatic artery. Now located laterally to this, um, you will find your bile duct. So the liver would create the bile, the gallbladder here is storing and concentrating it, and then they can secrete the contents into the bile duct. So we're going to talk about the duct system in just a moment. Um, the other thing that we can find more posterior to these structures is the hepatic portal vein, that nutrient-rich deoxygenated blood would be, um, would be draining from your superior mesenteric vein and inferior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein over to um, the hepatic portal vein. So now let's talk about the pancreas. We said that the head is cradled by the duodenum. The body would transverse the vertebrae, so we would find the vertebrae posterior to this, and then the tail is going to point over to the spleen. The spleen we will find in your left upper quadrant. So here's a cadaveric image of that. Here is our duodenum, and then the head of the pancreas is here. This would be the body, and then the tail at this um, lateral portion. And here is our spleen in that left upper quadrant. So just a quick note on the spleen, although we'll discuss its many functions, but one of its main roles is it's going to remove old red blood cells and hold a reserve of blood for us. And just another view of that spleen 
in the upper in the uh, left upper quadrant. So next, let's talk about our duct system. Our duct system is really assisting us in bringing bile and pancreatic juices into the duodenum. So we know that the liver is going to create or synthesize our bile. And the way it's bringing it down is through these right and left hepatic ducts. These ducts are going to come together to create what's known as the common hepatic duct. So we're draining bile from the liver at this point. But we also said that bile is going to be stored and concentrated within the gallbladder. So we have to have a duct there too, of course. So that is going to be called the cystic duct. So that drains the gallbladder itself. Now when the cystic duct comes together with the common hepatic duct, it becomes the common bile duct. And that will eventually lead to, um, to drain into the duodenum here. Now the other duct that, it's actually this back in here, but it's represented by the black line, is your main pancreatic duct. And this is gonna bring in those pancreatic juices from the pancreas into the duodenum. And this is just a nice illustration of that duct system once again. So what would this be called here? This would be your ha common hepatic duct. And this one here, well, the label's there on that one, but that's gonna be your cystic duct. And then here, we would have your common bile duct because your common hepatic duct came together with your cystic duct to create this common bile duct. And then this here would be your main pancreatic duct. And so you could see in this image that this common bile duct is merging with this main pancreatic duct and will lead to the major duodenal papilla. Now sometimes we will also have an, an, another branch off of this main pancreatic duct that will deliver the pancreatic juices through a minor papilla or minor duodenal papilla. So this is what it looks like in a cadaver. Here we have your right hepatic duct and your left hepatic duct draining the liver. That becomes your common hepatic duct. Then we have the cystic duct draining the gallbladder. And when that comes together with this common hepatic duct, it becomes the common bile duct. I think that's a little difficult to see where they come together here after it changes its name because that cystic duct is so posterior. Um, here's your bile duct and coming together with the main pancreatic duct. And then of course in here we would have that major duodenal papilla. So that is it for your um, screencast on the respiratory and digestive system. Please let me know if you have any questions and I will see you in lab.